Welcome, welcome, welcome to the live stream. Long time coming. Um, I hope you guys are all well on this Sunday morning. Right, in this live stream, what I'm going to do is break down the theory test the way it should be done. So I'm going to take these out. I'm going to break down the theory test in terms of what the DVSA is expecting, what you need to understand in terms of answering the questions. And then I'm going to do a live 50 question mock test for you guys. Again, breaking it down. For those of you that are new to the channel, my name is Dorian from Think to Success. Think to Success. I am a driving instructor. I obviously do intensive driving courses. I've been in driving instructing for about 27 years. Um, and in that time, obviously doing the theory test when it first came in as well. I do intensive courses in terms of the theory stuff as well, alongside the driving. Um, my pupils do four, four days in class, Monday to Thursday, two hours each day, do a mock test, which they have a one-to-one -one with me at the end of the mock test. And then um, I go through the wrong answers with them. And then they take their test on Friday. And normally, fingers crossed, it's a good result. And the pass rate's pretty high with that as well. So what I, I see your struggles every week. I know what questions throw pupils, um, what ones they struggle on. I know what the DVSA is looking for. And what I'm trying to do is pass that on to you guys um, through the YouTube videos and now um, lives. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the comments below. Um, and please put a cue in front of the questions and then I can um, find it quite easily and then I can answer it as we go along. Um, when we do the mock test, if you've got any questions based on the mock test, the questions that come up, feel free to do that as well. But I have to bear in mind it is live and I have 57 minutes just like I normally do on a real test as well. So I just want to see this comment advice. If you're on Fury Test Pro doing a mock, tests and passing also do other mock tests via other websites so you get as much exposure to as many questions as possible nicole one thing i will say i get this is common with you guys when you're doing um the theory test practice um the on the apps there's driving test driving test success which is what i tend to use in the classroom You've got the DVSA one. I would always recommend the paid version, by the way, $4.99, um, because it gives you the full question database and the full has a perception database. And there's the Theory Test Pro, which I use with my students that I'm using via uh, YouTube. That's what I'm doing, because I can see the test that you are taking. But one thing you guys have to remember when you are doing for apps, it's not the real question. They're sample questions. The DVSA is not going to release the real questions. That's the one thing you must remember. So when you go in, there's gonna be wordy slightly different. And for those of you that's watched the videos that I've done in the past, where I say do not memorize the answers because you're gonna memorize it based on the app question. So when you go in, there's wordy slightly different and then you guys get thrown off and then obviously you know what the outcome of the result of that test is gonna be. You need to understand the questions. That's the most important because if you understand it, regardless of how they word it, because you understand it, you know what the answer is gonna be. So I will repeat that. The questions on the apps are sample questions. They're not the real question word for word. They're samples. The feedback I get from my pupils, because I do this every week, they give me an idea what the question or how the question's worth is. So that's why I can help you a bit more than someone else who doesn't do this week in, week out. So I hope that gives you the answer that you're looking for based on the advice on the theory test. You've got another one um, here saying you are hoping to do your theory test beginning of next year, January. And what are we in now? We're in November. Um, it depends how often you're studying. That I can't answer. Everyone's different. If you've got time to study, yeah, you, January, beginning of January is going to be no problem. Um, have you booked your theory test? That's the other question I would ask. Have you booked it or are you just saying you want to take it? Get back to me in the comments on that.
Right, what I'm gonna do is, um, first of all, tell me what your struggles are with the theory tests, basically. What do you struggle with most? And then we can cover that as we go through. What I also wanna say as well with the theory test is don't overthink it. A lot of pupils overthink the theory test. The theory test is very simple once you know what they're looking for and it's safety. I say that a lot in the videos, for those of you who watch the videos, it's just safety. You have to choose a safe outcome, but your answer has to make sense. It's just like the driving test. For those of you who've taken driving tests or driving lessons, sorry, um, it has to be a safe and controlled outcome, obviously controlling the car and the safe outcome depending on the situation that you're in when it comes to driving. So when it comes to the theory test, it's black and white. It's either going to be safe or it isn't. And the theory test always leaves you in a safe situation or a safe outcome. And that is what you are looking for. So when you go through your answers, always think to yourself, what's the safest option with that? Do you have a little tip as well? If you don't know what the answer is, work backwards. Work out what it can't be. There's always one stupid answer on there. So when I do the 50 question mods, I'll show you, there's always one stupid one on there. Sometimes there's two but there's always one, eliminate that, you now got one in three chance of being right, rather than looking in one in four. So you can either, if you know and understand it, choose the answer, but if you don't, go for elimination. It can't be that one, it can't be that one, and see what you're left with. Sometimes by default, you're just left with one. So, um, I haven't booked, I haven't booked it yet. I spoke to the diva late, and they will give me dates and time slots for January. Sorry, I don't understand why you'd be speaking to the DVLA. I haven't booked it yet. I spoke to the DVLA and they will give me dates and times before slots in January. As far as I'm aware, the theory test dates are open like six months in advance. So you can pick and choose what date you want. If my recommendation, work out realistically what time you've got to study and then base your dates on that. I'll always put my dates in stone, um, if that makes sense, rather than, because you can study, 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 and before you know it, you're February, March. You're better off booking a date and work towards it. If you're not ready, you can always cancel it or postpone it. Um, the theory test is free working days in advance. So if you aren't, if you feel that you're not ready, postpone it. You've got three days, give them three days notice and move it back. But if you are looking to take it in January, I would still book it in January, take it in January. There's one or two things that's gonna happen. You're gonna pass it or fail it. If you fail it, it gives you a baseline so you know what to work on. So if you're getting 41, 42 uh, in terms of that, there's a little bit of work to be done. If you're getting in the 30s, there's lots of work to be done. So there's nothing wrong with taking the test and getting a baseline. Putting it off and putting it off and putting it off is not going to solve your issue because to be honest, you're never going to feel ready. Same thing with a driving lesson, driving test. You're never ever going to feel ready. Take it, see what the outcome's going to be and then build on that. Right, so I'm just going to break down the theory test for you guys. Um, let's just get rid of this. Right, the theory test is multiple choice. It's 50 questions that has to be answered. It covers 14 topics. My advice to you guys as well when it comes to studying, study all 14 topics. Do them as individuals and then take a test in those topics. That's the easiest way of doing it. You're covering every base possible. So it's 50 questions, 14 topics. At this precise moment, I'm releasing videos. A study with me series. I think the last one was motorway. There's one coming on Wednesday, which is road signs, road and traffic signs, which you guys are struggling. I'm um, doing one on has perception, which will be released hopefully next week or the week after. But I am doing a study with me series, which covers every topic and a 20 question mock test, which breaks it down in simple terms for you. So that's the easiest way to study for your favorite test, by the way, cover each topic. Because I need theory test support, so they will give me some dates for January. What, okay, what do you mean by you need theory test support? Just give me a bit more information what you need by theory test support, because maybe I can help with that as well. 
because the fairy test doesn't give you fairy test support anymore. So that's something you want to be careful with, unless there's a difficulty with your learning, and that's a different story altogether. And you've got to jump through hoops with that. I don't know if they told you that, but yeah, give me a bit more information what you mean by fairy test support, and then we can discuss that. Good morning. Um, I failed my fairy test. I don't know what to do again to pass it again. I've been studying four in one. I don't know. Maybe there's any link I can follow again. Thanks. So let me just read it again. Good morning. I failed my fairy test. I don't know what to do again to pass it again. I've been studying four in one. I don't know. Maybe there's any link I can follow. If you failed it, the only thing to do is do more study and take it again. There is no other, there's no shortcuts to that. Um, how much did you fail it by would be your baseline. Again, start with the baseline. How much did you get? Did you get in the 30s or did you get in the 40s? Also, the other thing as well, again, you guys, when you fail the theory test, you are so upset and disappointed. You don't look at the paperwork. The paperwork tells you the categories you felt got uh, the questions wrong in. And that's important because that's your baseline. If you got 42, I've got a video coming out as well, failed by one, which is common. I failed by one. In If you got 42 and you need 43, didn't fail by one, you got eight questions wrong. There's a weakness in your knowledge. Uh, that's the way you need to look at it. You don't need one to, you need one to pass it, which is basics, but there's a weakness in your knowledge. If you got 42, it means you've got eight questions wrong. And on the paperwork they give you, it lists the categories that you got the questions wrong in. Because what you must remember when you go to take a new test, it's 50 different questions. It's not the same questions. So if your knowledge is weak in X amount of categories and you get X amount of questions in those categories, you are probably going to fail again. So you need to look at the categories. So when they give you the paperwork, don't screw it up and throw it out. It's going to be beneficial to you. So, um, Nicole's just come back to me. Let me just see what she got to say. I have this book and this lecture. So there. Right, that makes sense. That now, now that makes a lot of sense. Yes, they will help you with that, but there's a lot of hoops you've got to jump through. Um, again, you said on your previous one you want to take it in January. Yeah, I will try and get everything in place as soon as possible with that. Um, but again, I would book a date, take it and see where you come, where, what the result is. Fingers crossed you pass it anyway, but if you have to take it again, it just gives you a baseline of where to go from there, basically. But yeah, the DVSA will help you out with that because that's um, learning disability. Oh, let me just get rid of this. Bring up this. Right. The time you have to do the 50 questions is 57 minutes. And you need 43 out of 50 to pass the test. So minimum score, you need 43 on that. When I do it in a classroom, pupils are doing the test in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, the, and failing, by the way, in the classroom. The question you've got to ask yourself is if you've got 57 minutes, why take 10 to 15 minutes? The chances are you didn't read the questions properly, you didn't understand the questions, that's why you chose the wrong answers. When I get to slow the pupil down, take 25, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, then they go on and start to get the pass mark within the classroom. Take your time, there is no rush. I do this every week and I tend to read the questions very, very carefully. I don't skim read even though I do it every single week, because like I said, sometimes the wording is enough to confuse you. And if I do every week and I'm a practicing instructor, you know, think about what you guys need to be doing to get this right and get this done. Um, so I just saw a comment from someone, if I can find it, there it is. Welsh Relics, I'm taking, hi, I'm taking my driving test next week. Do you have any advice? Practice, <laughs> that's the only advice I've got. Make sure you practice right up to test date. Um, stay calm as possible. It's just another driving lesson. If your instructor thinks you're good enough to take a driving test, he's got faith in you. 
it's just another driving lesson with a stranger. That's the way it is. It's nothing special. All the examiner says, show me why your instructor brought you here. As simple as that. And deliver the drive you've been doing on your driving lessons. And on test or the night before, just do what you normally do. Um, if you normally go to bed at 10 o'clock, go to bed at 10 o'clock. Do not go to bed extra early. Um, simple reason for that because if your body's used to getting eight hours sleep it's going to want eight hours sleep if you give it nine ten hours it's going to wake up tired and drained if you normally have breakfast in the morning make sure you have something to eat as much as you may be nervous have something to eat because your body expects the fuel give it the fuel but if you don't normally have something to eat do not i'll repeat do not start having stuff to eat because your body's chemistry is going to act differently with the nerves and the adrenaline you want to act the same way it's just another driving lesson with a stranger that's all it is right what do the devious say look for in the theory test mention it safety outcome has to be safe has to be controlled depending on the question but it's the safety factor if it's got the words safety safely and safe in the answer you have to shortlist it as a possible. It doesn't always work, um, but you have to shortlist it as a possible because they're giving you clues with that. Um, the other thing they look for, as I mentioned, is a control outcome, because it's just, just like the driving test where you control the car, but you have to control the environment. Normally the control situations to do with the first aid side of things. Um, third aid questions when it comes up in in terms of controlling it but the safety factor is more to do with the driving and your answer has to make sense it has to make logical sense as well so as i said sometimes you have the word safe in it but it just doesn't make sense and hopefully when i do the 50 question mod test something like that will come up and i can show you what i'm talking about as well once you've done the 50 questions and my little tip for you as well especially with the apps you can flag up anything that you're not sure of so i would as you work for it if you're not sure of the question or answer flag it answer it move on and then when you finish your 50 questions go back to the flagged ones because if you're kind of sure or 42 43 you got those right you just go back to the flagged ones do not i repeat do not go back to number one and work your way through all 50 because you've got time in your hands, you're going to start doubting yourself and you're going to start changing answers that doesn't need to be changed. Flag the ones you're not sure of so you go back directly to the flagged ones and you can do that on the app and you can do that on the test itself. So it's got a comment coming in. Um, thanks. That's no problem at all. Good luck with the driving test. Let me know how you got on. Don't add things into the questions as well. If the question is A, B, C, A, B, C, D, that's what it is. Again, you guys overthink, you start adding stuff into the question, you start taking stuff out. Once you start adding stuff in, taking stuff out, it's a different question. It's almost impossible to get the right answer when you take stuff out. So see the question for what it is, leave it as that. Don't overthink it, don't add stuff in, do not take stuff out. Once you've done the 50 questions, you move on to the hazard perception. There's 14 videos. So there's 13 videos. One of them's got a double hazard on there, which means you can score five. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, there's a hazard perception. There's a video that you've got to watch and you can score a maximum of five and it counts down to zero. You have to average at least three in every clip. If you get if your average is less than three, you're failing that. That's fact. So you have to average at least a three in every clip. Ideally, you want fours and fives. And it's a double hazard, two separate hazards, which means you can score two fives at ten. Um, I've got a video coming out on that in the next two or three weeks. Um, my advice on the hazard perception is click twice. When you see the problem, click and go one, two, click again and that would normally get you the five or the four. They'll always give you the highest score. So if your first click was a five or a four and you click on the second one, it's a three or a two, you're gonna get the highest mark anyway. To me personally, when I see people's click once, it worries me because they click too early, which means they get a zero. And funny enough, the hazard perception in a weird way, it's not about you seeing the hazards, it's about you getting a score. But I don't wanna go into too much of that 
today because today is just about really the mock test. If you guys want me to do a hazard perception on future lives, then let me know in the comments below. But yeah, it's 44 out of 75 to pass the hazard perception and it's 43 out of 50 to pass the theory test. You have to pass both parts same day, same time to get your pass mark on that. And as I said, just don't overthink things. Don't second guess yourself. Just be confident in um, when you go for the test as well. And the one important thing, they are not trying to trick you. The amount of times people in the classroom get a question, oh, they're trying to trick me. There is no tricks from the DVSA. It's plain black and white, it's safe or it isn't. There is no tricks. The questions might be a bit silly, but trust me, there is no tricks involved whatsoever. And for those of you who are new to the channel and have not seen my videos before, or got a fairy test coming up real soon, I've got a video on my channel and it's the five common mistakes for failing the fairy test. Um, and I see this every single week, so I'll put it in the video. Go and watch it if you've got a fairy test coming real soon if you haven't seen it already. too soon right so what I'm gonna do now let me just see if there's any more comments <laughs> thank you Welsh relics yeah leave a thumbs up like share it with friends who have got fairy tests coming up as well so what I'm gonna do now is jump and sh onto my laptop I want to share my screen And then we're going to do a live mock test. Just give me a minute to get it up. I get rid of. Yeah, um, has a perception, most times I click too early. That's the common thing for people, they click too early. I, like I said, I don't want to get too much into that because it is about mock test today, but the has a perception, treat it as a game. Um, just get a score, forget about seeing the hazard. It sounds weird. Don't worry about seeing the hazard, just get a score. So when you see a problem, click twice. Click once and literally go one, two, and then click again. And the reason for that, on the real test, it's actually a lot slower. And you also remember on the real test, it's on a bigger screen and it's all CGI's. On the apps, you've got the old clips and you've got some CGI ones and it's slightly faster. Um, my pupils don't have a problem with that once they know what they're looking for. But like I said, it's more about mm. you getting a score rather than seeing the problem. But like I said, I don't wanna to get too much into that because we have to do a mock test. So if I come out of that, get rid of that, and then hopefully you guys can see that. So I will click on mock test and click on that. So what I'm gonna do, as I normally do with the videos, for those of you seen the channel, for those of you that haven't, I tend to read the question break it down in simple chunks, explain it in detail for you guys, and then go through the answers and breaking it down and give you some explanation, show you some hints and tips along the way. Again, if you've got any questions along the way, pull it in the comments below, and then I can answer that as we go along. If not, I'll answer at the end, because I'm tend i gonna do a Q&A as well. No problem, no problem at all, that's what I'm here for. Right, so the first one, are passengers allowed to ride in a caravan that's being towed? Again, think about the safety factor. <laughs> caravan, someone's in the caravan while it's being towed. If it gets separated from the car, you know what's gonna happen with that situation. So the safety um, answer for that is gonna be no. It's gonna be as simple as that. Only stabilizers fitted, it's not gonna be a bad one. Yes, if they're over 14, no. Only if all seats in the towing vehicle are full, no. No, not at any time. And that's the safest option. No one's allowed in the caravan at any stage while it's being towed. 
what should you do if you're tying a trailer and it starts to swing from side to side? Right, if you are towing a trailer and it swings from side to side, the way to solve that problem is to ease off the gas. So the car slows down, so the caravan falls back in line. And that's the easiest way around that. So that's what we're looking for, something along to slow down, basically. Let go of the steering wheel and let it correct itself. No, because it's the trailer that is swinging, so the car doesn't need correcting. Ease off the accelerator to reduce your speed, which is what we just spoke about. And always read all the answers. Um, always go through all the answers, even though it's obvious that the answers would have been picked. Because sometimes there's two similar answers and one has more information on one's law and that's the one you want to be going for. Brake hard and hold the pedal down. And once you've got brake hard, it's not going to be the right answer with that. Accelerate until it stabilizes. No, so it's going to be that one. You're traveling behind a bus. What should you do if it pulls, if it pulls up at a bus stop? Right, pulling closely behind the bus. No, because if you pull in closely behind the bus, you can't see and you're going to be there for a very long time, especially the bus is slightly early. Um, accelerate past the bus. No, because people cross in front of the bus, if you're accelerating past the bus, someone steps, so it's going to be harder, for, or harder or longer for you to stop. Sound your horn. No, that's to alert, uh, alert people of your presence. You shouldn't be doing that. And obviously look out for pedestrians, because if a bus pulls out of a bus stop, um, people coming off the bus. So it's going to be that one. So I just want to tackle some of these comments. Um, I remember on the test day I did, I remember on the test I did on the day I took my theory test, I remember getting zero in like two clips and there's no mouse in the hazard perception on the real day. All right, let me just tackle this quickly. You, it is possible to get zeros and still pass because the average has to be three or more. So if you get a zero, especially, to be honest, if you get a zero, you're not gonna know about it. The only way you're gonna know if you get a zero, if you click too many times, they're gonna let you know. They give you a big, big fat red X and it says something like you clicked in an unacceptable manner. If that comes up, all they're trying to do is say, reduce the amount of clicks that you've done. Don't panic and not freak out. You can still pass with getting zeros. I've had one pupil get five zeros, but she happened to get all fives and the 10 on a double and still passed. So it's still possible to pass. Your average has to be three or more. So let me just repeat that. If you get a zero, don't freak out. You can still pass with that. uh good luck with that on Fuzzer. let me know how you got on if you need any help between now and then let me know in the live comments and you can always email me as well my email will be in the description below and on the videos so if you want any last minute advice on that let me know and good luck with it yeah just don't click too much if you click on the problems that there are that are problems you ain't got an issue it's if you're clicking on stuff that don't exist, that's when you're going to have the problem because the clicks represents the amount of faults on the video. So if you've got four faults, sorry, four, four faults, four hazards on the video and you're clicking 16 times, for example, that doesn't tally. But if you've got four hazards on the video and you're clicking eight to 10 times, that tallies. They're going to be wondering where you're getting so many clicks for only four hazards. So yeah, don't, if you click on the problems that exist, you haven't got a problem. If you're clicking on things that don't exist, yeah, you're gonna have an issue. Right, um, you are following a long vehicle approaching the crossroads. What should you do if a driver signals right but moves close to the left-hand curb? Right, with this one, lorries take a different route. For those of you that, that are not taking driving lessons at the moment, lorries take a different route. As drivers, we stay a meter to the left. When you go around the corner, you stay a meter as you go around the corner. Lorries have to swing out. So as much as they're singing left, they have to move out to the right to get around the corner safely or they're mounting the pavement. So with this question, you're looking for something like hold back and allow the lorry to do what it's got to do. Warn the driver about the wrong signal. It's not a wrong signal. Overtake on the right-hand side. You shouldn't be doing that. Wait behind the long vehicle. That's the safest option. Just wait and let him do what he's got to do and report the driver to the police, which again, doesn't make any sense whatsoever. 
you're turning right onto a dual carriageway, what should you do before merging? Right, this question comes up a lot again, especially if you are not taking driving lessons. You've got two types of dual carriageways, one standard like the motorway, central reservation all the way down the middle. And you've got this one with the image that we see here, which is what we call an urban dual carriageway, which is in a built up area, it has give way lines. Now with this question, let me just read it again, you're turning around to a dual carriageway, what should you do before merging? It's the answer to this one is check to make sure the central reservation is wide enough for you to fit, is the answer. So you've got to check to make sure that's wide enough for you to fit. If it's not wide enough for you to fit, you're gonna check for both ways to be clear at the same time. So you're gonna go across without stopping, turning right. And if it's wide enough for you to fit, you break it down in simple terms driving. Check to the right, make sure it's safe. Go in the middle, wait. Check to the left to make sure it's safe and then go. So we're looking for check the central reservations, one of you to fit. Make sure that you leave enough room for the vehicle behind. That's impossible for you to do. Check the central reservations, one of you your vehicle, which is that one. Position your vehicle's wheel to the left of the side road. You're turning right, so you shouldn't position wheel to the left. And stop, apply the parking brake and then select a low gear. And again, the other thing about the theory test as well, you're looking for what we call a generic answer. It has to be the same answer for anyone taking the theory test, whether it's in North London, Manchester, Birmingham, Luton, where I am. Um, with that, so it says select low gear. If you're doing automatic, you don't select a low gear. So that's not a generic answer. So it's gonna be that one. What should you do before making a U-turn? For those of you who don't know, Again, I never assume anything. A U-turn is just doing a turn in the road without stopping, just like a U-shape. This question comes up a lot and the people put signal. And then when they put a signal, I say, um, I will say to them, what signal would you give? Because there is no signal for a U-turn on a car. There's only three signals on a car. Signal left, signal right, and brake lights. With a U-turn, theory test normally gives you the option of a shoulder check or driving, we call it blind spot check. So we're looking for something along the lines of a shoulder check or a blind spot check. So check the road mark and see what U-turns are permitted. With the theory test, it's always gonna be permitted because they are doing legal stuff. So the theory test is always gonna put you in a safe situation with that. Select a higher gear than normal. Again, that makes no sense because you move off in first gear and automatic does it automatically. Given arm signal as well as using your indicators, there is no signal for a U-turn which we just discussed. Look over your shoulder for a final check, which is your blind spot check. Which is that one, if I can get this to tell. When must your vehicle have valid insurance cover? So, oops. Um, when must your vehicle have valid insurance cover? A lot of pupils, again, get confused with this. So let me just explain what, how it works. You have to, this is your documents, by the way, and it's in this order. You need MLT first. MLT says your car is road worthy. You need to tax your vehicle to say you can drive your car on the road. And then you need your tax, your car, for your car to be on the road. So it's MLT first, insurance to say you can drive it, and then your road tax. So the question says, when must, you, when must your vehicle have a valid insurance cover? It's before you can tax your vehicle. So before you can tax your vehicle is the first one, but again, read all the answers just in case. Before you, before you can scrap the vehicle, you don't need insurance, you can scrap your vehicle. Before you can make a sworn, if you didn't know what that is, that stands for statutory off-road notification. You're filling one of those if you're not going to tax your vehicle and take it off the road. So let me just put that screen back on. I'm talking, there's not screens on there. Um, so that's what statutory off-road notification is. And before you can sell your vehicle, you don't need insurance before you can sell your vehicles, but the insurance is before you tax your vehicle. Your, here we go, just mention that. Your car requires an MOT certificate. When is it legal to drive without an MOT certificate? So just in case you guys didn't know, um, it is, you need MOT to, have, to be able to drive a car on the road. The only time 
you can drive your car without LMOTs when you're going direct to an appointment. So appointments already been booked and you're gonna go direct. So that's the only time you can drive legally without an MOT. So up to seven days after the OCV has run out, no. When driving to an MOT center to arrange an appointment. Now this is what I mean about reading the questions, so reading the answers very carefully. If you read this one, it says, when driving to an MOT center to arrange an appointment. Now, most people would go for that, but it says to arrange an appointment, the appointment has to be already arranged. So that's not the right answer. When driving to an appointment and MOT center, when you're driving to an appointment, so it's this one. And that's what I mean about reading the answers very, very carefully, because those two are very, very similar. When driving a car with the owner's permission, I mean, it's not gonna be that one. What would suggest you're driving on icy roads? Um, the key word is icy roads. What, you, what makes contact with icy roads? Your tires and wheels. So you're looking for something along those lines. When there's less tire noise, tires making contact with ice makes sense. This is what I mean about your answer making sense. There's less transmission noise. If you didn't know transmission is your gearbox, it's just an American term, as your gearbox. Your gearbox has nothing to do with ice. When there's less engine noise, again, engine noise has nothing to do with ice and there's less wind noise. So the only one that makes logical sense is tyres making contact with icy road. It's going to be that one. You're about to start a journey in freezing weather. What part of your vehicle should you clear of ice and snow? Again, think about the safety factor with this. Okay. Oops, keep doing that. You're about to start a journey in freezy, freezing weather. What part of your vehicle should be clear? <laughs> your windscreen. If you can't see, you can't be safe. So it has to be your windows or windscreen. So the aerial, no. The boots, no. Windows, yes. And the bumper, no. How can you use your vehicle engine as a brake? Now, again, this comes up week in, week out. Um, if you're not taking drive lessons, sometimes it's hard to get your head around this. And if you're doing automatic lessons, it's hard to get your head around this. So let me quickly explain this. With, auto, sorry, with manual cars, gears, you can use gears to help you slow down. Low gears are power gears, drive the car at slow speed. So one and two technically are your power gears, but drive the car at slow speeds. Three, four, five, and six are weaker gears, but drive the car at faster speeds. So the question here states, how can you use your vehicle's engine to brake? Because one and two are power gears, drive the car at slow speeds, it means choosing a lower gear is what we're looking for. By changing to a lower gear, that's, what you're looking for. But again, read all the answers by selecting reverse gear. That's not gonna help you slow down. And plus you can't go into reverse while the car's moving forward. It's a different mechanism. So you want that, allow that to happen. By selecting neutral, you should always be in gear while the car is in motion and neutral's not a gear. And by change to a higher gear, higher gear's only gonna make you go faster as we discussed. Three, four, five, three, four, five, and six are weaker gears, but drive the car at faster speed. So it's gonna be a lower gear. You're driving behind a large goods vehicle. What should you do if your signal's left but steers to the right? Again, this question came, came up earlier um, and sometimes that's the theory test works. If you're lucky, you may get two or three similar questions that repeats itself. And if you know what the answer is, you already got automatically two or three correct answers. Um, so it's similar to what we've done on the previous one. So let me just read it again. You're driving behind a large goods vehicle. What should you do to vehicle signals there but stairs to the right? It's hold back, stay behind. So slow down at the vehicle turn, which is that one. Drive on, keep into the left, no. Overtake on the right of it, no. Hold your speed, hold your speed and sound your horn, no. You're driving along this road. What should you do if the red car cuts in close in front of you? Okay, so if a car cuts you up, just hold back. Um, that's the safest option with that one. So drop back to leave a correct separation distance. That's the safest option. That's the correct one. Give a long blast of the horn. That's road rage technically. 
Accelerate to get closer to the red car. Again, that can't be safe. And again, a slightly road rage and flash, flash your headlights several times. And if you didn't know, flashing the headlights um, in the highway code basically is warning of your presence. And if you flash your headlights on the driving test, to be honest, it's over and someone's gonna fail you for it. What should you do when a person herding sheep asks you to stop? Weird question. But um, yeah, if someone's herding sheep and asks you to stop, stop, um, normally stop, switch off your engine, because sheep aren't road trained. Um, the engine ticking over or beeping a horn is going to scare them and make them scatter across the road. So we're looking for something along the lines of stopping and maybe switching off the engine. So try to get past quickly, no. Ignore them as they have no authority, no. Continue on but drive slowly, no. Stop and switch off your engine, which is what we spoke about. Again, the safest option on that one. So if you guys got any questions, please put them in the comments. Let me just check any comments on here. And there isn't, which is fine, let's continue. If you, hopefully this is giving you some benefit. If it's not, let me know, because I'm trying to break it down in simple terms and giving you as much clues as I give my students in the classroom as well. What will affect your, what will affect your vehicle stopping distance? Um, with this, it's going to be tyres or road conditions. So we're looking for something along the lines of that, tyres or road conditions. And what I mean by that is um, wet, ice, snow, that type of thing. Time of day, no. Speed limit, no. Street lighting, no. Condition of the tyres. If your tyres are near bald, and if you didn't know, tire, the legal requirement for tyres is 1.6 millimetre tread depth, which comes up on the theory test sometimes. Um, if it's less than 1.6, this class is bald. If it's bald, it's going to take you longer to stop. Why is traveling in neutral for long distances known as coasting bad driving technique? Neutral is not a gear. Basically, it's just free rolling. So neutral is not a gear. So when you are in neutral or the clutch is down when you go around corners, again, for those of you taking driving lessons, there's no gear selected, so you don't get the engine braking. The two, there's two plates and they're separate. I have got a video out on that. Um, so that's why coasting in neutral is bad driving technique, okay? So it has lack of engine braking or lack of control is what we're looking for for an answer. It will make the engine stall. You can't stall in neutral. There won't be any engine braking, which we mentioned just now it will cause a car to skid it won't cause a car to skid and the engine will run faster technically the engine will run faster but the asking the question is why is neutral why is traveling neutral for long distance known as coasting bad driving technique and because there's no engine braking with that right why should you test your brakes after this hazard if you didn't know ford is a lot of surface water basically and as you drive through it, it covers your wheels, cover your brakes, keeps your brakes soaking wet. So you should test your brakes after coming out the other side just to make sure they're working properly. So that's what we're looking for. So why should you test your brakes after this hazard? You'll be going down a long hill, no. You'll be on a slippery road, no. Your brakes will be wet because we've just gone through a lot of water, so it's that one. You, you'll, have, you'll have just crossed a long bridge, no. What do you do if you see a large box fall from a lorry onto a motorway? Catch up with the lorry and try to get the driver's attention. You can't do that for safety reasons. Stop close to the box until the police arrive. Again, you're stopping on the motorway. That's not safe. Go to the next emergency telephone and report hazard. Again, in case an emergency, you're reporting it. That's the safest option. Pull over to the hard shutter, then remove the box. Again, you're going onto a carriageway where cars are doing up to 70 miles an hour. And again, that can't be safe in any aspect. At an incident, how could you help a small child who isn't breathing? First aid, if a child isn't breathing, you're looking to check their airways, make sure their airways is open. Something along those lines is what we're looking at. Put them in a recovery position and slap their back. If they're not breathing, you can't put them in a recovery position at that point. Open the airway and begin CPR. That's a possible. 
talk for a complaint until the ambulance arrives. If they're not breathing, talking to them, it's pointless. You're not going to get a reaction from it. And you need to get them to start breathing again. And find their parents and explain what's happening again. That's not possible. That's the safest option and the quickest reaction to get someone to start breathing again. There's been a collision. A motorcyclist is lying injured and unconscious. Why should you only remove the helmet if it's essential? Um, you can scratch the helmet as you remove it. No, they might not want you to remove it. No, removing it could let them get cold. No, removing it could make any injuries worse. It's going to be that one. If someone's lying unconscious, sorry, if there's been a collision, a motorcyclist is lying injured and unconscious, why should you only remove the helmet if it's essential? Because removing it could cause more injuries, especially injuries you can't see, neck, spinal, internal, that type of thing. If someone's lying injured and then seem okay, leave them where they are, don't move them unnecessarily. And that's for future questions that come up as well. What's the spilling for a car towing a trailer on a motorway? Now again, this comes up week in, week out, and people's get sh people struggle with this. Now, the way that I normally explain it, it's a motorway. Learn what you can do as a car driver. Remember, you are learning the theory test or taking drumless as a car driver. A car driver can only do max 70 miles an hour on a motorway or a dual carriageway. So when this question is now asked a heavy goods and towing vehicle, you drop it, drop it by 10. So if you know what you can do, 70, drop it by 10, it becomes 60. So it's that one. When should you use the left-hand lane of a motorway? Everyone uses the left-hand lane unless you're overtaking. So everybody uses the left-hand lane unless you are overtaking. So when your vehicle breaks down, no. When you're making a phone call, no. When the road head is clear, no. When you're overtaking slower vehicle in other lanes. Let me just read that again. When should you use the left-hand lane of a motorway? When your vehicle breaks down, definitely no. When you're making a phone call, definitely no. When the road ahead is clear, it's that one. And again, like I said, I do this every single week. That's why I've got to read the questions again and again and again. And I would advise you guys to read the question and answers very carefully. If the road's clear, we should all be staying left. What restrictions apply to people who have a provisional driving license? The restrictions are they shouldn't, they're not allowed to on the motorway. They should be with someone over 21 and have their license for three years. So we're looking for something along those lines. Um, they can't drive over 30 miles now. You can. They can't drive unaccompanied, which is that one. They need someone next to them, like I said, over 21 and have their license over three years. They can't drive with more than one passenger. Yes, they can. And they can't drive at night. Yes, they can. When may you stop and wait in a box junction? Again, this gets confusing, especially if you don't take driving lessons. You can only stop in a box junction when turning right and prevented by oncoming traffic and your exit is clear. That's the full answer. Let me just repeat that. You can only stop in a box junction so let me just repeat up. You can only stop in a box junction when turning right, prevented by oncoming traffic, and your exit is clear. That's the full answer, and they can take any part of that answer to give you that on the theory test. So let's take a look what they're giving us. You're in a queue. When you're in a queue of traffic turning right, no. When you're on a roundabout, no. When you're in a, when you're in a queue of traffic going ahead, no. When oncoming traffic prevents you from turning right, which is going to be that one. What's the national speed for cars and motorcycles on the dual carriageway? I just mentioned that earlier on. Motorways, dual carriageways, technically the same thing. How fast can a car go? 17 miles an hour. So it's going to be that one. You're going to turn left from a main road into a minor road. What should you do as you approach the junction? So you're going to turn left from a main road into a minor road. What should you do before approaching the junction? Normally look out for pedestrians or keep well to the left is the two common ones that they ask or give you as an answer. Swing out to the right just before turning. That's what lorries do. Keep well to the, well to the left of the road. That's a possible. Keep in the middle of the road, that's turning right. Keep just left of the middle of the road. 
keep just left of the middle. That's again fast turning right as well. So it's gonna be that one, keep well to the left, i.e. a meter from the curve for those of you doing driving lessons. You're driving at night with your headlights on main beam. A vehicle is overtaking you. When should you dip your headlights? Now this comes up a lot. And again, pupils get confused with this one. So let me just read that question again and break it down for you. You're driving at night with your headlights on main beam. Main beam is the brightest light. It means the road is pitch black and you've got your main beam on to light it up so you can see clearer. A vehicle is overtaking you. When should you dip your headlights? You want to turn your main beam off when the vehicle has overtaken you and gone in front of you. So you can use the back of the lights to guide you. That's what the answer is. If you turn it off any sooner, you're driving in the dark, technically. So only if the other driver dips their headlights, no. Sometime after the vehicle has passed you, not sometime after, because you're blinding them from behind. As soon as the vehicle passes, so as soon as he passes, you're gonna dip your lights. And before the vehicle starts to pass. Again, if you if you turn up before they start to pass you, um, you're driving in the dark temporarily, so it's not going to be that one. You're turning right from a main road into a side road. There's no oncoming traffic. What should you do? The pedestrians are standing on the pavement waiting to cross the side road. Let me just break that down. There's a lot of information on that one. You're turning right from a main road into a side road. There's no oncoming traffic. What should you do? Pedestrians are standing on the pavement waiting to cross the side road. This comes down to the new highway code rules where you should be giving way to the pedestrians if it's safe to do so. So we're looking for something along the, those lines. Sound your horn to alert the pedestrians to your presence. No, don't need to be doing that. Turning because the pedestrians are safe on the pavement. <laughs> it's possible, but the new highway code rule says you should be giving way. Wave at the pedestrians, inviting them to cross the road. You should never wave anyone across the road. Once you do that, again, your drum test would be done and dusted, it'd be over. Wait and give way to pedestrians. Again, based on the highway code rules, it's gonna be this one. You're driving in slow moving queue of traffic. What should you do? What should you do just before changing lanes? So change down to first gear. If you're automatic, you haven't got gears to change down to. So technically, that's not a generic answer. Remember earlier on, I mentioned about generic answers. It's got to be the same across the board. So it's not gonna be that one. Give a slowing down arm signal. If you're changing lanes, you're already going slowly anyway, because it says slow moving, cure traffic. Look for motorcyclists filtering through the traffic. That's got to be safe. You check your mirrors, make sure no cyclists are coming between cars and sound the horn. They love a the sound the horn on these theory tests. Um, it's not going to be that one. You're on a country road. What should you expect to see coming towards you on your side of the road? Right, let me just explain this one. Country roads don't have pavements and they normally give you a triangle sign, triangle sign, with pedestrians in it. And that means pedestrians walking in the road. So the answer to this question is gonna be pedestrians walking towards you, which is on your left as a driver. That's the full answer. So let me just get the questions back up so you guys can see it. Horse riders, no. Pedestrians, yes, because there's no pavement. Motorcycles, no. And bicycles, no. Which road users are most difficult to see when you're reversing? your car. Again, this com comes up and with this, with this question, the pupils don't realize children are road users. When it says road users, it's anyone who uses the road, whether you walk on it, drive, cycle, it's anyone who uses the road. So children are road users. So it's going to be children who are gonna be the hardest or most difficult to see. It's not gonna be motorcyclists. It's not gonna be car drivers. It's gonna be children. And it's not cyclists. What's the purpose of road humps, chicanes and narrow rings? Now, if you didn't know road humps, chicanes and narrow rings, the other word for that is um, traffic calming measures. Traffic calming measures are designed to keep you slow to reduce your speed. So you're looking for something along the lines of reduce, reduce your speed. So to reduce traffic speed, 
which is what we just spoke about, to separate lanes of traffic, no. To allow pedestrians to cross, no. To increase traffic speed, no. It's going to reduce your speed. Like I said, it's called traffic calming measures is another word for it, for the ferry test. What's the legal minimum depth of depth of tread for car tyres? Just mentioned that earlier on. If you remember what I said, legally, 1.6 mil or millimetres. And it's that one. It carries points. That's one of the reasons why it's in the theory test as well. If you get caught driving a car, entire tread depth is less than 1.6 millimetres. You are going to get three points on your licence before you even get going. How would underinflated tyres affect your vehicle? So, the way that I normally explain this to my pupils is um, football, for example. If the ball is flat, you're going to have to work harder to kick it, harder to make it bounce higher. So, it's flat. So, you're working harder. So, how is it going to affect your vehicle? It's going to make your vehicle work harder. So, something along those lines that we're looking for. So, the vehicle headlights would aim higher. No. Vehicle stopping distance would increase. That's a possibility. So, let me just click that. The flash rate of the vehicle's indicators would increase, no. The vehicle gear change mechanism would become stiff. So based on the answers that they're giving there, the options, your vehicle stopping distance would increase. But I'm gonna read the answers just again, just to make sure. The vehicle's headlights would aim high, no. Stopping distance tires, because it's got tires there, and stopping distance tallies, that makes sense. The flash rate vehicle indicator doesn't make sense. The vehicle's gear, making it doesn't make sense yep so based on that it's that answer and again i stress why you read the answers again and again if you are not sure there's nothing wrong with it you've got 57 minutes take the time you're better off doing it now pass it first time you don't have to go through the stress of taking it again what part of your vehicle does the law require you to keep in good condition right in terms of the law um it's only one thing it's going to be your seat belt because it's something you have to wear on every journey all the other bits and pieces which i go through transmission that's your gearbox in terms of automatic normally um mlt takes care of that seat belt is law that's what we just spoke about gearbox again mlt would take care of that and your door locks mlt would take care of that but your seat belts have to be in good condition because you need to use it on every single journey what could you do to reduce the volume of traffic on the roads so with this one, cycle or walk, basically, that's how you can reduce traffic on the roads. Walk or cycle on short journeys, it's gonna be that one. Travel by a car at all times, you're not re reducing volume of traffic if you're gonna use a car all the time. Use a car with a small engine, again, it's still a car, regardless of what size the engine is. And driving a bus lane, you can only drive in bus lanes at certain times of the day, not all the time. You're driving on a road with several lanes. What does this sign above the lanes mean? So what I always suggest that um, pupils do is look at the image, take the information in, and then go looking at the answer. So you're driving on a road with several lanes. What does these sign above the lanes mean? So it means these two lanes are closed off. This lane, this arrow means move to the left. So you're driving in these two lanes. So we need to use the, get the phrase that tallies with that. The two left lanes are open. Two left lanes are open. That's a possible, let's tick that. The two right lanes are open. Two right lanes are closed, so that's not true. Traffic in the right lanes should stop. No, because you've got open lanes. If there was red X across every lane, then yes, everybody will come to stop. But like I said, the green one says it's open. Traffic in the left-hand lane should stop. And it's green, green for go. So it's gonna be that one. And that's the way to work out. Just see if the phrase makes sense with the image. Let's just make this larger for you guys. Um, what does a solid white line at the side of the road mean? This comes up a lot. When they said a solid white line, they're talking about this one this white line here. A lot of people think it's that, or they're talking about that. They're talking about this, and this line marks the edge of the carriageway. So technically, from this point to here, you should be driving. So it marks the edge of the carriageway. So 
So edge of the carriageway is that one. Let's just do the others. Foot path on the left, no. Traffic lights ahead, no. And cycle path, no. Right, what should you expect to see? What should you expect if you see this sign ahead? This, if you didn't know, is um, a sharp deviation to the left. So that's what that means, it's a sharp deviation to the left. So if the road would bend sharply to the right, no. The road would bend sharply to the left, yes. The road will go steeply downhill, no. The road will go steeply, steeply uphill, no. It's gonna be that one. You need glasses to read a vehicle number plate, the required distance. When must you wear them? When you're driving, if you need it to read a number plate, you're gonna need it when you're driving. That's simple as that. So when you're driving, whenever you're driving, it's gonna be that one. When you think it's necessary, no. Only at night, no. Only in bad weather, it's gonna be that one. If you need it for to read the license plate or registration plate, you're gonna to need to read it, read it. You're gonna need it on all the time so you can see where you're going. How does drinking alcohol affect your driving behavior? So alcohol is going to affect you, it increases concentration, it does not increase concentration, it decreases it, it increases confidence, it does, it makes you overconfident, alcohol, it leads to fast reactions, no, your reactions become slower and it improves judgment skills, it doesn't improve your judgment skills, it makes you overconfident, alcohol just makes you overconfident, so it's going to be that one. What does this sign mean? Um, that's a tunnel basically um traffic danger spots ahead no low bridge ahead it's the way to know that's not a low bridge there's no signs or numbers to let you know how low is low so you can see that one ancient monument ahead no and tunnel ahead that's what it is it's a tunnel ahead what does this sign mean um this sign means two-way traffic straight ahead so with images you always go from bottom to top. That's how you have to look at your signs and images. So always imagine you're at the bottom and you're going up. So with this one, we're at the bottom, we're going up with the arrow and arrows coming down towards us. So that's two-way traffic straight ahead is what we're looking for. Two-way traffic straight ahead, is that one. Multi-way contraflow system ahead, no. Traffic approaching has approaching you has priority, no. Two-way traffic crosses the one-way road. It'd be, if, if, if it was that one, it's going to be arrows going across. So the arrows are going across on that one. So it's going to be that one. How can you identify traffic sign that gives orders? Orders are circles. It's just red circles. It's simple as that. So red circles are orders. Um, they're square with brown borders. No. They're circle with a red border. Yes. A rectangle with a yellow border. There isn't a sign with a yellow border. And a triangle with a blue border. No, it's going to be red circles. And another little tip for you red circles, 95% of red circles are no's, by the way, on that. What do the long white lines along the center of the road mean? These are hazard lines. You've got to be very careful. There's two types one short with big gaps, and one long, which is this one with short gaps. And these are hazard lines. They let you know where hazards come in. They don't tell you what the hazard is, they just let you know there's a hazard coming you have to work out. In this case, there's a bend in the distance. So there's a hazard warning line. Um, bus lane, no. Hazard warning, yes. Give way, no. Lane markings, no. What do you do when you see this sign at a crossroads? This is a traffic light crossed out, so it means the traffic light is not working. So you want to drive with care or go carefully or drive slowly. So something along those lines is what we're looking for. Find another route. No. Maintain the same speed. No. Carry on with great care. You carry on with great care. It's got to be the safest option. And telephone the police. No. So it's going to be that one. Again, this comes up a lot on the test as well in the classroom that we do. Um, which arm signal says that the car you're following is going to pull up? Right, let me just go through these so you know what they mean. This is turning left. So A is turning left. B is turning right. C is slowing down. 
D does not exist. As I said earlier on, you only got three signals on the car, turning left, turning right, and slowing down. And this is slowing down. So if you're, when you're pulling up, as in parking up on the left, you slow down to park up on the left, it's gonna be C. Right, now we come to the um, videos. And the last three questions tend to be videos. So always watch the videos very, very carefully. And there's nothing wrong with watching the video two or three times as well, to so make sure you've got the information that's required. So I would always suggest that you watch the videos two or three times and then go looking for the answer based on the question they're giving you. So let's take a look with the videos. Taking the information as well that you saw in the videos. Okay, so let's see what the first question is. Why is there a warning reduced speed now? Did you guys see that? So let me just repeat the question and then I'm gonna show you the video again. Why is there a warning reduced speed now? So let's just watch the video again. Crossroads and a double bend. So let me just repeat that. You've got crossroads, triangles are warnings if you didn't know. So you've got warnings of crossroads, double bend, reduce speed now. So when pupils do this, they either see one or the other. They don't see both. So that's what we're looking for. Something that's got both of them in there. Traffic is emerging from the left, no. There's a staggered junction, no. There's a T junction, no. There's a crossroad and double bend. So it's gonna be that one. Why has the line changed? So why has the line in the center of the road changed? Again, let me just show you. These lines here are lane markings, left lane, right hand lane. You're now coming to the problems, which was on the last question. So you're now gonna have hazard warning lines and they're gonna change. So can you see they're getting longer now? And the reason why they're getting longer because we're approaching the hazards, side roads and the bend. And that's the reason why. So to warn you the speed camera ahead, no. To warn you the speed limit has changed, no. To warn you of hazard ahead, because hazard lines, yes. And to warn you not to change lanes, no. The driver towing the caravan wants to turn around to a dual carriage, what should you do? Right, this question is similar to the one we had in the dual carriage where earlier on. And this is what I mean about the theory test. They can word it in either way, give you different examples, but it's the same type of thing. So let me just pause it. So that's the urban dual carriage way which we had earlier. This is blocking it. But what the driver should be doing is, what the driver should be doing on this is checking to see if he can fit. Because he can't fit, because he's got the caravan, he's gonna wait for both sides to be clear at the same time. That's what he's looking to do. So let me just read that question again. Let's get this up so you guys can see. The driver towing the caravan wants to turn around to the dual carriageway, what should they do? Wait for both sides to be clear because they can't fit. Move out when an approaching driver flashes the headlights, no. Wait until the road is clear in both directions before turning, that's the one we need. Turn left and find a suitable place to turn around. No, move part into the central reservation and wait until it's safe to turn. No, and this is what I mean as well. It's got safe there, but it's partly into the central reservation. He's blocking it. So that answer doesn't make sense. And again, that's why I said sometimes if you've got the word safe, safety, safely in it, it doesn't always work. It has to make sense in terms of what you're going to choose. So there you have it. Hopefully you guys have got some satisfaction from this video, um, sorry, this live. Um, there's nothing to review, so I don't understand why.
I did a flag in here. Right, so I'm not understanding why. Oops, change the answer. You send one to your code address. Oops. Right, I'm not understanding why it's not letting me click finish, but let's go through all of them. So if you guys got any comments, let me know. Or any questions, let me know um, while I go through this and end it. I'm assuming I didn't click one for a reason on that. I'm not understanding why it's not letting me finish in that. Let me just double check to make sure I've cleared all 50. Because it should allow me to finish. And that's a disadvantage of doing it live rather than the video. They all click, so I don't understand why it's not letting me to finish. All right, total number of tests, blah blah blah. Review, all right, end test. Right, there you go. So hopefully you guys got some benefit from this. If you guys got any questions, any issues with your theory test, please it in the comments below if you just joined the replay what we've just done is a live mock test where i've broken it down in the beginning of this live i recovered what the dvsa is looking for how it works what you guys should be doing in terms of looking for a generic answer but there's videos out there i've got one coming out on wednesday which um coming out on wednesday which is traffic road and traffic signs and I know a lot of you are struggling with your road and traffic signs. I've gone into details with the blue circles, red circles, your triangles, and I've done a 20 question mock test on that. That should be going live on YouTube on Wednesday. I've got a hazard perception coming out, hopefully the week after as well, because again, you guys are demanding um, that to be done because you're struggling with hazard perception. It is a simple technique that I will show you on that which works for all my pupils. All my pupils don't really struggle with the hazard perception once they understand what they're looking for. It always comes down to the 50 questions. The simple reason for that, we don't know what 50 questions you're going to get. But if you understand the questions, you'll understand the answers. No matter how they reword it, you should be passing your theory test. But as I said, if you've got any problems, let me know. I have also got a video where you can work with me on, um, in terms of passing the theory test, which is again is on my channel. Just watch the video, fill in the bits and pieces that you need to, and I will get you registered on the theory test pro where I can see the mock test that you do live and I can give you hints, tips, and advice on that. But if there's no questions and no comments, let me just double check. And there isn't, I'm gonna end the live and thank you for joining me and hopefully I'll see you in the next one. I aim to do this once every other week unless there's a demand for it. Um, so I won't see you next Sunday, I'll see you the Sunday after. Good luck with the theory test and good luck with the studying. Thanks for joining me, bye.